to a new lecture in, uh, in 4820. So today's topic is going to be about um, language models in general. So these are models that help us assign uh, probabilities to sentences in natural language. And uh, they are probabilistic models. So this means that we we're going to need some a very brief and quick refresher and basics and probability theory uh, just to make sure that we all are on the same page. Uh, but just also a very quick overview of what we have done so far, so to put things into perspective. So I think four weeks ago or so we started with vector space models. So these are these geometric models to represent words and or objects in general in, uh, in a multi-dimensional space. Uh, we used it to uh, build what we refer to as semantic spaces, which are vector space models based on uh, the distributional hypothesis. And then we moved one step further into uh, representing classes, groups of words, uh, or objects again that belong to the same class. And they were introduced to uh, classifiers, Rokio and KNN. One is centroid based and the other is uh, exemplar based. And then we did clustering again within this notion of vector space representation. And in all of these cases, what we were working with is what we refer to as pointwise uh, classification or prediction, meaning that our input was just one single point represented as a vector in a, in a high dimensional space, and our output was a class of that uh, word or the most similar words, etc. But we didn't have any. Uh, structured complex input to our classifiers and all of our work was limited to geometric models. So if we contrast this to what we are going to learn about from now on is what we refer to as structured prediction or structured classification. It's this more complex way of classification where the input to the classifier and the output are no longer just points but it could be a sequence of points, a sequence of words and the output could be a sequence of labels or categories. So uh, this, this notion of structure prediction is, is really a loose term, umbrella term for different methods. So there is no one specific definition. You can, you can probably understand it through examples. So one typical example of structured prediction is part of speech tagging, which we will look at next week. So in part of speech tagging, very briefly, we have a sentence, a sequence of words, uh, as an input to the parts of speech tagger. And the output would be a, a sequence of parts of speech, lexical category, uh, of the same length as the input sequence. So, and parts of speech is basically these lexical categories such as verb, noun, adjective. So all languages will have different types of lexical categories. We'll, li we'll look more into this next week. But this is sort of overall picture of what do we mean by structure prediction? And we're going to work with three types of structures. So today we're looking at sequences. So a list of words, a sequence of words, <coughs> where we, uh, we specifically are going to look at language models. So language models are these models that assign uh, probabilities, as I said, to uh, sequences of words. Uh, labeled sequences is what I just described as part of speech tagging. So you're given an input sequence and your output is a sequence of labels, of categories, of the same length. Uh, and here we will use head and Markov models to actually work with uh, uh, this type of structured prediction. And in the end, uh, we will move towards even more uh, sophisticated uh, structured prediction algorithms where we do syntactic analysis and there the structure is a tree. So we want to build the syntactic tree of a given sentence. Uh, and that's what we refer to as statistical parsing or statistical chart parsing. In all of these cases, we are working with probabilistic models. So there is a sense of probability, uh, mo likelihood of the output. In contrast, again, to what we had before, which is just geometric models. So <coughs> and what we are, so in, in probabilistic models, we want to determine the most likely interpretation. So what do we mean by most likely interpretation? So if you have the following linguistic constructions, so uh, 
which which of the two strings is most of the two following strings is most likely so she studies more for syntax or she studies more for syntax uh, we've mentioned this example before so if you have a, a speech recognizer uh, and I say this sentence uh, this the, this program that is doing speech recognition uh, needs a way to see to 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 define which of these two sentences is more likely in 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 the English language so that's the most likely interpretation here we can also use uh, these probabilistic models to actually decide which of the following uh, category sequences or sequences of parts of speech tags is more likely so uh, this is what we call part of speech tagging or lexical categorization so if you have a sentence like time flies like an arrow this has two probable or at least two probable uh, sequences of part of speech tags the first one is uh, where time is a noun flies is a noun and like is the verb so this means that there is a type of instinct uh, or a, a type of <coughs> insects that has a uh, that is called time flies and these time flies happen to like some arrow so this is one possible interpretation and the other interpretation is uh, time flies like an arrow this is the proverb where time goes or passes as quickly as an arrow flies so there flies is the verb and uh, like is the particle here so th what we are trying to, to show here is that you have, when you do part of speech tagging, there are several possible outcomes of uh, the program, or the program could generate different sequences, and one of these is also more likely than the others. And you want a way to you want to ha to have a way where you can actually say that this is the most likely interpretation. So this is where the probabilistic sense go into into the picture. Again, also, you can have this kind of uh, uncertainty or ambiguity on another level, which is the syntactic level. So if you are watching a TV and you, you see the headline, Oslo cops chase man with stolen car. So headlines tend to be very short and they cut off many words. So this has two interpretations. Uh, one is that Oslo cops, uh, they have actually stolen a car to chase a man or they are chasing a man who has stolen car and this ambiguity arises from the fact that uh, this preposition uh, with stolen car is or this prepositional phrase sorry uh, could be attached to two different fra uh, phrases in the sentence so this is what we call prepositional phrase ambiguity and these are two different possible again they are possible analyses but one of them is more likely than the other and we want to assign the most uh, to find the most likely interpretation so in all of these cases what we are just repeating all the time is that we want to find the most likely the most likely arises from the fact that there is uncertainty there is uh, ambiguity so uh, when when there is uncertainty when we actually that's when we actually start to employ probability theory right so when in, in real in the real world when you are working with any problem whenever there is uncertainty then you actually have to have some notion of probability and uh, then make decisions based on the most likely scenario or the most likely outcome of uh, a given experiment so we'll start then by a quick review and then sort of move into the core matter of the uh, of the lecture today so <coughs> in probability theory we often refer to something as an experiment which is or a trial which is this this uh, process whose outcome we don't know so until we actually do it so whose outcome is uncertain uh, so we basically uh, are observing a process in general so this is the experiment and this experiment even though we don't know its outcome we know all the possible outcomes of this experiment so and that's what we refer to as the sample space or the omega so the set of all possible outcomes of a random experiment is is the 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 omega or the sample space and <coughs> we are often interested in some events so some events happening or not this this is very uh, very abstract I, i'm going to give examples now so that you can relate these concepts to 
uh, immediately and then you will remember them. Uh, so events are these, these subsets of the uh, sample space that we are interested in. So we are interested in an event happening and this event could happen when one of its uh, possible outcomes, which happens to be also a subset of the sample space, occurs. And our goal in the end is to <coughs> find or to assign probabilities to events. So we denote, denote this by P of event A. So if you have an event A, P is the probability of this event. And this probability is a real number between 0 and 1, inclusive, and 0 being the impossible event, the event that will never happen, 1 being the certain event, the event that always happens, and the higher the probability, the more likely this event will happen. So before I turn the slides, so say that our experiment is uh, rolling a die, a six-sided die. What's the sample space for this experiment? One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm, I'm just yeah trying to test the where we are and and this. So it's yeah, it's very simple, right? So let's move. Let's replace all these definitions with examples. So the experiment is rolling a die, and the sample space, the set of all possible outcomes, is clearly from one to six because I said it's a six-sided die. So you know that you get a number from one to six, and the events you can you can define as much. Uh, I mean as as uh, Whatever, in whatever way you want, right? So it's an arbitrary thing. Uh, of course, it will not make sense if it's it's not part of the sample space, but still you can define an event. And uh, in this case, uh, an event A is defined as rolling a six. So that's that's our event A. This is how we define it. Event B is getting an even number. And the subset of outcomes that satisfy this event or that makes this event happen is basically just the even numbers that are part of the sample space. <coughs> and so what's then the uh, probability of event A, which is getting a 6 when you roll a die? 1 over 6, yeah. And event B? It's, it, I know it's an easy question, but it's good to actually know that you are on the same page. So I, I, ne I need to hear the answer. Point five. Point 0.5, yes. So it's 3 over 6. Now our experiment is flipping two coins. So the sample space of, uh, of this experiment is of size 4. Why is that? Why is it of size 4? Why do we have four outcomes? I mean, how do we compute it? It's easy. You can you can enumerate it yourself, but the over so, so the the generalized way of computing it. Yeah, so it's 2 by 2, right? So you have two outcomes for the first coin and two outcomes for the second coin, and that's that makes up 4. Of course, here we we distinguish between having heads first and then tails first, and that's why we have four outcomes. Now we define our events A and B in A being that the same outcome uh, occurs both times, meaning that we get either two heads or two tails, and event B being that at least uh, one of the uh, outcomes is heads or head. So that's then there are three cases or three outcomes in f out of our sample space that satisfy event B. And then the probabilities are P of A is point 0.5, yeah, and P of B is, yes, it's here. That's, yeah. So basically, I just want to say that it's sort of, I mean, when you calculate this, is uh, the way you calculate it is basically, so I'm just jumping ahead a little, uh, to, to calculate the probability of an event A, what you do is you divide the size of the, or the cardinality of the subset uh, that uh, satisfies event A by the cardinality of the sample space. So in these cases, the size or the cardinality of the event A is 2, and the cardinality of the sample space is 4, so 2 over 4. So that's the 
the overall picture. Now we are rolling two dice and the sample space is then of size 36, yeah, so again it's 6 by 6. Uh, our first event is that the result sum to 6, which could be 1, 5, 2, 4, 3, 3, 5, 2, uh, uh, sorry, 4, 2, 5, 1. Uh, our event B is that the uh, results are even, meaning that the numbers are even. So 2, 2, 2, 4, 2, 6, 4, 2, etc. And yeah, as I just said, now to, in order to compute these probabilities, what you need to do is to divide the cardinality of the uh, event A uh, set or subset of the sample space over the full size of the sample space. So these are just you know the, the basic terms that we want to move forward with. Uh, some axioms that you already know, it's just stating them again out loud. Uh, the probability of an event, A, any event, should be between 0 and 1, inclusive. Uh, the probability of the sample space, so getting an outcome from the sample space, is of course 1, so that's the certain event. You, you're guaranteed to get heads or tails. There's uh, the probability of an ev uh, event A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B, where A and B are mutually exclusive, meaning that if event A happens, then certainly event B won't happen, and the other way around. More useful axioms that we're actually we're, we're going to use is also, again, something you already know, is the probability of an event A equals 1 minus the probability of not A. So the probability of getting an even number is e or equals the probability of 1 minus not getting an even number. So this is good to sort of keep in mind. The probability of the empty set is 0, so because you're guaranteed to get some outcome. Uh, we'll often talk about joint probability. Actually, joint probability is one of the important concepts that's going to be an underlying uh, uh, sort of a concept in, 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 the, in, in language modeling. So a joint probability, P of A and B, is the probability that both A and B happen, so together. Uh, and it could be written as, you know, as, as A, B with the set intersection, so this is the set intersection sign, or with comma. And probably the easiest way to describe uh, joint probabilities is through uh, uh, the Venn diagrams. So if our sample space is represented as this rectangle here, so this is our sample space, and the circle here A represents the subset of outcomes that correspond to event A, and the circle here represents the subset of outcomes that correspond to event B, what we are interested in is this intersection between these two uh, circles. This is where the joint probability happens. So this is where event A and B happen. So again, if you look at our example, what is the probability when throwing two fair die that A, the result sums to 6, and 2, that at least one of these results is 1. So separately, we know that the result sums to 6 is 5 over 36, right? So because you have 1, 5, 2, 4, 3, 3, 4, 2, and 5, 1. So that's 5. 5 over 36. And that at least one, uh, at least one of the results is 1. That's 11 over 36. Because you have, again, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 4, etc. But that both of them happen at the same time, the joint probability of getting the sum to 6 and at least one of them is 1, what is the probability of that? Sorry? Uh, n n yeah, no. Actually, it's not the product because they are dependent. These two are these two events, but we'll come to that later. Actually, it's, it's good that you said that because this is one thing we haven't talked about yet, but these are two dependent events, so you can't just take the product. Yeah? Yeah, so it's 2 out of 36. 
So now we are just still doing it in sort of in this, the simple way of looking at the set of possible outcomes and look at which of these outcomes satisfy the joint probability. Of course, there is a way to compute it. If these two events were independent, which we will define later on, then you could have taken the product. But they are not independent, so we will need another way to actually uh, compute it in a more generalized way than, than just looking at the sample space and saying, okay, it's 5, 1 and 1, 5. Because that, that in real world will not work. So you can't just enumerate all possible outcomes and do this. So the basically what you want to know now is this, this notion of joint probability and then we'll come back to how to actually compute it when you have dependent or independent events. Also, sometimes we have uh, partial knowledge about the outcome of an experiment and that's what we refer to as conditional probability. So we know something about the uh, outcome of uh, an experiment. So uh, the, and the, the sort of we, we the notion here is that uh, we have two events A and B, and now we know that B actually happened. So we can write the uh, conditional probability as such here. So it's P of A, and then this vertical bar which we 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 pronounce as given. So given. B. So the probability of A given that B happened. How do we actually compute this? So uh, we want, again, if, if we are looking at the same events, so we want event A to be the result sum to 6. Given, now we know that at least one of these results is 1. So this will actually change our probability computation. So And it will actually have an influence on the probability because now you know something. So if we look again at this Venn diagram, that was the joint probability. So again, this rectangle was your sample space, A and B, where the circles were representing each event separately, and their intersection is the joint probability. Now what happens when you actually know that one of the results was actually one, then your sort of sample space, in a sense, you are actually trapped in this circle here in B because you know that B happened. So now you're asking what's the probability of landing in this intersection out of B and B in contrast to what your question was in the joint probability when you didn't know anything what's the probability of landing in that intersection out of this full sample space the, the rectangle. So here the partial information, the partial knowledge given that B happened actually sort of restricted our uh, question to this to the circle and the more formal way of computing this probability is basically to divide the joint probability of A and B by the probability of B. So this is the def definition of uh, conditional probability. And B of course is should be bigger than 1 because I mean it doesn't make sense for B to have happened and its probability is, is uh, uh, sorry I said 1, 0. B should be the probability of B should be larger than zero, because uh, of course the this this formula will be ill-defined anyway, and it doesn't make sense for it to be zero if we said that it happened, given that it happened. Okay, so out of this equation here, uh, the uh, the the uh, equation to compute conditional probability, we can derive the uh, something we call the multiplication rule. So the joint probability has a has a characteristic that is actually symmetric, meaning that you can actually compute the joint probability in two ways uh, using the conditional probability. So you can compute joint probability of A and B by multiplying the probability of A, uh, sorry, by yeah, my multiplying the probability of A with the, mu with the probability of B given A, or by multiplying the probability of B by the probability of A given B. So how did we arrive at these equations uh, here? It's, it's basically just, if you look at the, the way we define conditional probability, if you simply multiply both sides by the probability of B here, then you get the joint probability on one side and the probability of B times the probability of A given B. So it's, it's very fairly simple and very intuitive, but it's very useful. So now we can actually, we have a way to compute the joint probability through conditional probability. And we can generalize this multiplication rule to something we refer to as the chain rule. 
So we don't need to actually limit ourselves to two events. We can do it on a sequence of events from A1 to AN. And then basically the rule is a, 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 an, a sort of a, an iterative application of the multiplication rule. So now what we do is we say, so the joint probability of events uh, A to a, uh, to, uh, A1 to AN is the probability of A1 times the probability of A2 given A1 times the probability of A3 given A1 and A2, etc., etc. So for each event, A, uh, I, we look at the, uh, we condition it, we, we look at their condition, its conditional probability given the previous events. And this chain rule will be actually very useful. Again, this is one of the sort of building blocks for our language model. Uh, because as you can see, it allows us to uh, split this complex computation into smaller parts. And uh, we can actually choose the way we split it, uh, or the way we, we break it down because Again, if you can, you look at this symmetry up there. You can see that actually, uh, you can either compute the joint probability through the probability of A uh, times probability of B given A, or the or or B. So it depends on what you have, what's available for you. You can choose. So now, if I yeah, let's let's do this first and then go back to the. So if I ask you that, if or or let's say that A is the event. Uh, that it's going to rain tomorrow and it has a probability of 1 over 3 and B is the event uh, that if we flip a coin it results in heads what is the probability of A given B so what's the probability that it's going to rain tomorrow given that we flipped the coin and we got heads <laughs> 1 over 6 why is that? But this is uh, so. Uh, this is conditional probability, not not. Uh, I'm asking about the conditional probability. So I, I I'm telling you that B has happened. I'm, it's not the joint probability. Not that both of them. So now we B we know that B has happened. I mean, it's true what you said that it's it's actually it's right. That they are independent. It's one over three. Yeah, so basically these two events are independent, so it, it really doesn't tell us anything if I tell you that I flipped a coin and, and, and I got heads, that will not change the probability of it raining tomorrow. So these two events, uh, A and B, are so, or, or sort of, if knowing B is, uh, is true has no effect on event A, we say that these two events are independent of each other. And which uh, more formally would mean that the joint probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B and the conditional probability of A given B is basically just the probability of A and the same could be said of on B given A it's just the probability of B. So now we know this, we know that there is this notion that there are some events that are dependent, some events are not, are not uh, dependent or independent. So if we go to this uh, computation back here and so now we know these two events are actually not uh, are they, they are not independent they are dependent so basically just multiplying the uh, probabilities will not give us the right answer we want to compute the joint probability of A and B and uh, we, we're going to try and compute it through this uh, uh, th through the multiplication rule so through uh, utilizing the uh, joint, uh, the conditional probability. I'm going to try and type this here. I'm not sure. So that's the probability that we want to compute. And as is it clear? <laughs> just uh, uh, just for the recording. So we can compute it through the probability of A times the probability of B given A, right? So that's the multiplication rule we introduced. And the probability of A, we have it here. So it's 5 over 36. And what's the probability of B given A? So what's the probability of uh, at least uh, getting at least one 
1, uh, given that we know that the result sums to 6. That's 2 over 36, but your sample space is no longer 36. That's, if, if you remember this picture that we looked at here, oh. So we know that uh, one event happened, so your sample space is no longer 36. Your sample space is actually of size, sorry? Five? Yes? So because because there are only five ways where you actually get the sum to six, right? So and out of these five, two over five. Out of these five, there are two instances or two outcomes where the number one has happened. So so then it's two over five, and yeah. So ba basically, that's two over thirty-six, right? So is is it clear to what happened here? So it's it's. It's really simple, but I, I think sometimes it helps to go through simple examples so that you, uh, yeah. Now I have to do this thing. <laughs> yeah, so uh, now we can test our intuition even more about this. Uh, so I'm going to present a problem to you. So say that you have a friend named Yoda and uh, this friend wakes up in the morning and he's feeling sick so what he would uh, do basically as most people will he will go online and try to sort of look for what's wrong with him so he goes onto webmed or whatever is the website and types in the uh, symptoms he is having and try to diagnose himself and then after typing the symptoms the website would return that 99 percent of the people who had a disease D had the same symptoms Yoda has. So read this carefully. 99% of the people who had the disease D had the same symptoms that Yoda has. So Yoda freaks out because he thinks that he has a 99% chance of having the disease D and he goes to your place and tells you the story. Now you are more relaxed. You don't think you have this disease. It's not your problem. So you actually continue reading on this web page. So he doesn't he didn't finish reading. He's just he just read the first sentence and then he freaked out. So you continue reading and then you find that the prevalence of the disease, the prevalence is basically the portion of people that have the disease at a given point. So the prevalence of the disease is one in thousand people. So one in thousand people will have this disease D. And furthermore, the reliability of the symptoms are as follows. So it's, it has a false negative rate of 1% and a false positive rate of 2%. Do you remember what's, what are the false negative or false positive, or what do, what do they mean in this context? Yeah? Yeah. Which one is which? It's the other way around. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, the false negative is that you actually have the disease, but you don't have the symptoms. So, uh, and this you can see already from this 99%. Right, so 99% of the people who had the disease didn't have the symptoms. And the false positive is that 2% of the people who had these symptoms, they didn't have the disease. So what you want to do is to actually compute the probability that Yoda actually has the disease. So we're going to compute this together because I think we don't have a lot of time to actually sort of discuss it. So. Uh, let's say that event A, let's, let's formulate our problem. So let's say that event A uh, means that Yoda has disease or anyone has disease and B is uh, that someone has the symptoms. Now what we know from the description that I g just mentioned 
is that the probability of having the disease, the probability of A, is 0 0.001. So we said that one in thousand people will have this disease at any, at any given point. So that's the prevalence of the disease. And the probability of having the symptoms given that you have the disease is 99%. And the probability of having the disease given that you don't have the symptoms, uh, sorry, <laughs> give it, uh, the probability of having the symptoms given that you don't have the disease is 0 0.02. So that's the false positive uh, uh, that's I'm not sure I pronounced this correctly. Let's let's yeah. So the probability of having the symptoms given that you don't have the disease is 0 0.02. Uh, and and that's uh, that's what we yeah what we said here is the po false positive rate. And then the uh, uh, what we want to compute is the probability of having the disease itself given that you have the symptoms. So you have the symptoms and you want to compute the, the probability of having the disease. And the reason why Yoda would have actually freaked out is that because he hasn't read this sentence properly that actually given that you have the disease, the probability of having the symptoms is 99%. But it's not that, it's not this probability here that given that you have the symptoms, what is actually the probability of you having the disease? This is the difference and this is what we want to compute here. So, if we draw this table where we uh, sort of want to, and, 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 and the cells here, so A and B would be the, we want to fill the joint probabilities. So on this table, A, not A, B, not A, uh, not B are the events we just described, and the cells in between here will, will be the joint probability, so A and B, not A and B, etc. And this is, this is the given, this is what we have. So we can just fill it in the table. So the probability of A is uh, 0 0.001, so 1 in 1,000. And uh, the total sum of all of these probabilities should be 1. So we also, this, we, we also know this. Uh, if you remember, the axiom we mentioned is like the probability of A is, uh, equals 1 minus the probability of not A. So not A in this case is 1 minus A, which is 0 0.999. So, 999 people in 1,000 will not have the disease. So now we can compute the uh, probability of A uh, and B, the joint probability of A and B, using the multiplication rule. So we can use it, we have the probability of B given A. So this we have it already here. And we have also the probability of A again it's in the description so we can just multiply them and get the joint probability of a and b and this we also have again so we can just uh, plug in the numbers and compute it so now we can add these two uh, joint probabilities to actually get the probability of b so the probability of b could be computed as the joint probability of a and b and plus the uh, joint probability of not A and B. So this will give us the probability of B. So this is actually now the probability of having the symptoms by itself, just you know, the probability of having uh, the symptoms of disease D then are yeah, 2% or something like that. Uh, now what we can do basically, since we know that sort of the sum of this row is basically or oh, oh sorry, the values in this row are the sum of the two rows here. Uh, we can just subtract the first row from the last one to get this one. So again, simple tricks, um, it's very intuitive. The, the, the idea behind them is just uh, knowing the basics will allow you to do, to do this. And now we have everything we need to actually compute the probability of uh, having the disease given that we have the symptoms. We can compute this by dividing the joint probability of A and B by the probability of B and then uh, we have the, the sort of the real probability of Yoda having the, uh, the disease given that he has the symptoms. And now it's 
it's no longer 99% as he thought it would be. It's actually 0 0.047. And uh, sort of the, the idea of this example is just to show you that sometimes probabilities, or when you think about pro probability problems, or they might work counterintuitively. It's, it's just about reading exactly what is written and uh, then basically applying the rules you know. But one o important observation here is that what we just did here in, 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 this, in this whole problem is uh, an application of bias theorem, which simply follows from the joint probability uh, equation, so we know it already. Uh, we simply, so if we go to this joint probability, uh, I hope it's not so far back. So here, since we know that this, so there are two ways of computing uh, the joint probability, either through uh, conditional probability of B given A or A given B. So these two, two terms, these two sides are equivalent, right? So from these two sides, we can actually uh, say that the probability of A times the probability of B given A ac equals the probability of B times the probability of A given B, right? So this is, this, this is so clear. Uh, then basically what we can do is we can divide either side of these two, or, or the both sides of these two equations, either with the probability of A or the probability of B. And if we divide it by the probability of A, this will give us that the probability of B given A equals the probability of B times the probability of A given B divided by the probability of A. So this is ba Bayes' theorem, is, is basically that we can actually reverse, oops, that was, we can reverse the order in which the conditional probability is is uh, is being computed by applying the bias uh, theorem, which yeah stated here, and uh, so the order of dependence uh, sometimes, as we will see later on, is is available in one way but not the other. So as we have seen now, again, if we put it in more concrete terms, we actually knew the uh, probability of uh, having the uh, the symptoms given that we have the disease and we wanted to compute the other way around, right? So, and we, we, we managed to do this through this application of different rules and one of them was the bias theorem. And this will be used again within, in conjunction with, uh, with the chain rule that we also presented uh, where we could actually compute the uh, joint probability through an iterative application of the multiplication rule which is basically just the conditional uh, probabilities. I'll present this problem with, uh, I, just very quickly. Some of you might know it already. Uh, you can think about it in the break and then maybe we can just quickly look at it but we don't have much time to. So the Monty Hall problem is based on some TV program where you have a uh, you're in a game show, imagine that you're in a game show, and there are three doors. And behind two of these doors, there is a goat, and behind the third door, there is a car. And you're interested in winning the car. So you, as the, consistent, uh, the contestant, uh, you have to select one door and hope, of course, that the car is behind this door. And me, as the game show host, I'm going, so once you select the door, so say that you selected door number one, uh, I'm going to open one of the two other doors and show you that there is a goat behind it. So since I'm the game show host, I know where is the car. So you've selected number one and two and three are, all of the doors are closed. Uh, two or and three are left, sort of the, the rest of the doors. So I, I'm going to open door number three and show you that there is a goat behind door number three. and uh, present you with the opportunity to actually now change your choice. Do you want to change from door one to door two? And the question is, will you be more likely actually to win or not? Or is it the same? Or does it actually ma make any difference whether you change or not? Whether you change your choice or not? Some of you might know the problem already. So if you know the answer, yeah, we, we're we going to quickly look at it in the break. But just think about it. Think. Uh, whether changing the ch switching your choice between one door and another will actually increase your uh, opportunity of winning and why if it does and if not also why just uh, yeah 
that's yeah, that's that was good in time. So we'll we'll come to this after the break. It doesn't matter. No. Okay. Yeah. One of two. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So what you can say is that it's not really unique to add one step to and not to two. That's so are you in favor of switching or not? No, because you're, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, no, you, of course you can. <laughs> no one will force you not to. Yeah. Okay, so you don't think that the probability change. So those who agree, can you raise your hand? Oh, no one agrees with them? <laughs> okay, and those who disagree, who, yeah, just give me an, one argument then. I, I, just, uh, yeah. So, first time you had one. O yeah. Okay, so yeah, you have a 50% chance of winning now, you're saying. Uh, but, okay, yeah, so basically, so the, what we are trying to say is, does opening a, cor a, a, a door actually changes the probabilities, right? Does it have an effect on the probabilities and sort of... Uh, uh, this is it's it's very normal to actually disagree on this. Uh, it's it's a very confusing problem. If you Google it, then you'll find that there's lots of people discussing it. And I mean, when when it was first presented to a newspaper, thousands of people tried to argue for one way or another. There was, of course, but there is a right answer. So, as as you you rightly mentioned, is each of these doors will have a probability of one over three of having the car behind it, right? So when you choose door number one, so that's one, uh, I'll try again to do it here. So that's one over three for this door. That's what you have chosen, right? So there is two over three then left for the two doors. So that's the probability of the car being in one of the two other doors is two over three. That is also clear, right, for us now. Now when I open the door, the third door for you, this 2 over 3 probability is concentrated in door number 2 only. Because I opened, I, I basically revealed that there is no, no uh, car behind door number 3, so this 2 over 3 for the rest now is concentrated over 2. So actually over a long time, you are more, you are more likely to win if you, choose, if you change your choice. And if you think about it in more, so in a, in a bigger number, so if you think that you have 100 doors, okay, and again, you pick one door, you pick door number one, what's the chance of having the car behind that? One over 100, right? So that's, that's the chance. And then, one of, uh, and then 99 over 100 uh, is the chance of having the car in one of the rest of the doors, right? So that's the uh, picture here. Now, as a game, the game host, I'm going to open 98 of these doors. So if I open 98 of these doors and keep another door, and then I ask you, do you want to change? And you stick to your choice, which already had 1 over 100. And now I actually just concentrated this whole probability of having the car in the other side, which is one of these doors, and I opened 98%. So actually, this 99% is now concentrated in that car. So it's over uh, and, and that door. So over time, of course, it's more likely that it will be behind that door. So it, it, it takes time to actually get it, but uh, 
and I'm not sure I always get it, so to be honest, but it makes sense. So if you think about it, it makes sense. And if, if it doesn't make sense, then you shouldn't worry because <laughs> also other people find that that, that that it makes sense. It's it's just an interesting problem to read about. Uh, for now, I think it makes sense. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so of course, I mean, this. I'm not sure if I understood you correctly, but sort of. So to compare, so just try very quickly. We don't, we can't, we can't spend a lot of time on this, but just to, to compare it very quickly. If you have two doors only, then you have 50 50, right? So that's, that's for sure. If you have three doors, this situation here presents a different distribution of the probability. So you have one over three for each door at the beginning, and then uh, you chose the first one. Uh, when when I open the third door, this the probability of having the goat there is two over three, in in the sense that building on on this information that over time, yeah uh, sorry uh, uh, that the sort of the original distribution is yeah. Yeah, that's also true. The second one is one over three. Yeah. But we still chose the first one, so then why would you say that the probability of two over three is the second one? No, what, what I'm saying is that the probability of you not choosing or not choosing a door that contains the car is two over three. Because you only have one choice, right? And each of these choices has a probability of one over three. So you pick one choice and that's your probability and that's one over three so the two over three is for the other two doors which you couldn't pick so this is what i refer to as the rest so the other doors and when i open one of these other doors there is still a probability of two over three that you actually didn't pick the right option because you started with the settings that you actually had three choices now you, of course now you don't have them i'm yeah i'm sorry i i really have to move on but uh I can't claim that I can fully describe it to you and uh, as I said don't worry if you don't you're not 100% convinced uh yeah let's let's just maybe talk about this later or discuss it and uh but I have to move to the <laughs> main topic really of today's lecture uh, so uh basically if I give you the sentence now that we have space the basics and probability theory we can move to a new topic so I assume you can predict what I wanted to say. So uh, now that we have covered, now that we have reviewed, right? So or now that we have uh, refreshed, maybe. But I couldn't. I can't say now that we have slept the basics, right? So this is uh, an example where I can I can show you that language is predictable. So you can when I start saying a sentence, we have uh, then you have some kind of understand uh, or, or expectations of what's going to be the next word. And this is in, 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 in all languages. So in, in Norwegian, if you say devar en, and then you probably expect an adjective and a noun, right? So devar en fin dag, for example. So you can do that in French also. So 
when you start saying je ne parle pas, then you expect anglais, français, whatever, sorry for the pronunciation. Uh, so uh, there you also have some kind of expectations that there is going to be a, a language that is going to be said, right? So language, natural language, is redundant. It's, uh, uh, we, we, we tend to repeat things, which makes it more predictable in a, in a way. And also, the previous words that we say, the context, Im uh, impose some kind of constraints on what we, we're going to say next. So these constraints could be semantic or syntactic. So syntactic, as in like in this uh, Norwegian uh, phrase, devar an, you can't expect to have a verb, right, after an. So you would maybe have a uh, an adjective, a noun, but this is this this an is the uh, uh, sort of an article, an definitive article. So you expect something. There is a syntactic constraint here. You can't just put anything. The same with the uh, f example in, in the French uh, language, where you actually semantically you expect to actually to 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 talk about something that is spoken. I, I cannot speak, or I don't know to how to speak a language or. Maybe a programming language is possible, but it's, it's not open for any kind of words to have there. And that's what we want to do. We want to actually try to learn how to predict, in a sense, what could be next, and uh, how to assign a probability to a sentence, to a sequence of words. And we're going to do this through uh, looking at frequencies and probabilities, uh, and through what we uh, call language models. So, very briefly, language model is a probabilistic model that assigns approximate probability to an arbitrary sequence of words. So, I, I say a sequence of words, random sequence of words, and then this language model will give it a probability. How likely is this, or uh, an actually approximate probability, how likely is this sentence to be said in Norwegian or in English, etc. We'll, we'll look closer at this, but why do we actually need language models and where do we use them? So if you're doing machine translation uh, and typically you have two languages, a pair of languages, so, uh, what we refer to as a source language, so the language you're translating from and a tar target language, the language that you're translating into. And say that you're ha you have some kind of old uh, program where your translation is based on lookup, dictionary lookup. So you look up the meaning of each word and then you just stick them together and you end up with these two different sentences. So she's going home, she's going house. Of course, the second one doesn't really sound right. And you want a way to actually assign probabilities to each of these two sentences. And ideally, your model that assigns probabilities should, ha should assign a higher probability to she's going home rather than she's going house. And sort of this language model then can be part of your machine translation system. So your machine translation system would generate a list of possible translations and then your language model will assign probabilities to these different translations and pick the one with the highest probability. So this is what we call the flu uh, fluency. So when you translate you also want to the, the, the translation to be fluent, to, be, to, make, to make sense or to feel sort of as if it's, uh, it's uh, someone who has fluency in this language has actually written this. Again, this is the same example we, example we presented before in, in uh, speech recognition, so you want to be able to assign uh, probabilities to possible outcomes of a speech recognition system. Uh, we're not going to repeat that. So, and spell checking, so spell checking, the traditional old-fashioned way of doing it is basically, again, dictionary lookup, so you start typing in Word or uh, whatever program, more the processing program you're using, and then you look. The program will look up each each word you type in a dictionary. If it doesn't exist, then it will highlight that with red, right? So this is a misspelled word. But here, there, is actually a correct word. So it's a legitimate word, but it's actually still wrong to use it in this uh, position, in this sentence initial position where. What you actually meant to write is there as an T H E R E. And there is no way to find this uh, with the traditional uh, methods where you just do a dictionary lookup because, again, this is the right word. Whereas if you use a language model which uh, assigns a uh, probability to your sentence, this sentence will be very unlikely. 
and then you will get an error in it. But the actually the most relevant and probably the, the application that you all know by now is this predictive keyboards that you use on your phones. So that's most of those who use uh, smartphones will have this automatic prediction where you start typing a word and then you get a suggestion or you even when you finish typing a word you also get a suggestion for the next word. So this is what we call predictive keyboards or input prediction and these two things are different. So to start typing and get a suggestion for a word that's what we call character based prediction. So you start typing the first two letters and then you get a suggestion for a word. But you also sometimes you get suggestions for the next word and based what, on what you have written so far and based on what others have written. And this is an application of language modeling. So this is basically what we are going to look at. It's how to predict the next word and how to assign probabilities to full sentences. So a language model, then as I said, is a probabilistic model, let's call it M, that assigns probabilities, M, uh, PM of X to all strings X in a language L. So if we think about how we described events and sample spaces, etc., our sample space is the language. All possible strings in this language is a possible outcome of our experiment, quote unquote. So L could be infinite. And what we want from the language model is to be able to assign a probability for any string, any arbitrary string within our language. And this probability should be, of course, between 0 and 1 in order for it to, to make sense, to be a probability. And the sum of all probabilities, all possible uh, utterance, uh, the, the probabilities of all possible utterances is 1. So more concretely, we want to build a model where we, uh, our input is a sentence a sequence of words, so w what is really a sentence, it's just words, and we want to estimate the likelihood of this sentence. So, and as I just said, a sentence is basically just words, so it's a sequence of words, so really the probability of a sentence is the joint probability of its words. Is this clear? So, if you want to compute the probability of any given utterance or sequence as uh, a sentence so I say utterance sequence or sentence I'm, I'm referring to the to the same thing here it's just a, a sequence of words and uh, joint probability we know now that uh, if you remember the chain rule that we just introduced in the first part of the lecture uh, joint probability could be computed through an iterative application of the multiplication rule which would transform then the probability from uh, the, the probability computation from joint probability to a conditional probability. So what we do then is, in order to compute the probability of a sentence, we compute the probability, the joint probability of the words of the sentence happening, and this, using the chain rule, can be then broken down to the probability of the first word times the probability of the second word in the sentence given the first word times the probability of the third word given the first and the second word, etc., etc., up until we uh, arrive at the last word in our sentence, Wn, and there it's the conditional probability of Wn given the uh, all the previous words in the sentence. So given Wi from i equals 1 to n minus 1. So what we are doing then is basically we are multiplying the conditional probabilities and each of the words and each conditional probability is, is basically a probability of a given word is conditioned over all the previous words. So let's take an example to make this a bit clearer. So, so if, we, I, if I say I want to go to the beach, this is my sentence, and I want to compute the probability of this sentence. The words are basically the elements in the sequence and uh basically this this is this is the uh application of the uh, as i said the chain rule so uh basically the 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 probabilities is th uh, of the sentence is the probability of i times the probability of want given i and then times the probability of uh go <coughs> sorry yeah two given i want etc so uh what we are asking is what's the so the to, in order to compute the probability of full sentence, we look at each of, uh, word within the sentence and condition its probability over whatever has been said before or the previous context. 
So if we take this definition as is and we try to apply it to this sentence, so I want to go to the beach to read about Markov assumption. It's just a sentence that I want to compute the, its probability. Here, once we arrive at the end, assumption, so we want to compute, so again, this is basically just the multiplication uh, of, of the different conditional probabilities. We arrive at the last word, assumption, and this is uh, the conditional probability of assumption given I want to go to the beach to read about Markov. And there is no guarantee that we actually have seen this before. So there is no guarantee that our data, this is the database model, data-driven model, include such a sentence. So there is no guarantee then that this probability actually could be computed. So we immediately, once we, once we start looking at this, we immediately uh, see the problem of, of uh, data sparseness, which we have mentioned before. And we know that language is actually very creative. So it, it, it's, this is a, an intrinsic part of, the, so of, of, of of language. So we know that it's redundant, but we also know that it's creative. So you can say a sentence now and you can be 100% sure that no one has said this sentence before. Uh, and it could be still a grammatical sentence and a sentence that makes sense. So obviously this assumption that we can condition the probability of a given word over the full context, the past, uh, all the words that happened before it, is not going to work in practice. It might work for a short context, so or like w won't give an I, but it will not work for assumption given I want to go to the beach to read about Markov. That's, that's just too long. So here we actually uh, introduce the Markov assumption. So Markov is, or Andrei Markov is a Russian mathematician who introduced, who said basically that uh, in general, very generally, that a, the future state of a dynamical system does not depend on the full or not, does not can be approximated by looking at the recent history. So I can predict the future by just looking at the recent history. I don't need to look far back into the history. And we can translate this to uh, our case here by saying that in order to estimate or to compute the probability of assumption given this long history, we can actually just approximate, it, approximate this probability by looking at uh, uh, just one previous words or two previous words. So what we are saying is that we can approximate the probabilities here, the conditional probabilities, the, the, uh, the full context can be approximated through two words or three words. So in other words, what we are introducing here is a partial independence assumption. It's an assumption. It's not necessarily true. So what we, what when, when, we, when we make this approximate equivalence between the probability of assumption given the full context in contrast to the probability of assumption given just the previous word, we made a partial independence assumption, make, meaning that the probability of assumption doesn't really depend on the context from I to about. It just depends on Markov. So this is a simplification and that's why it's an approximate way of computing. It's not an exact way, but it's, it solves our problem of uh, uh, the fact that language is very, very creative and data is very sparse and we cannot actually account for all possible contexts that could uh, occur. Of course, this limited history, what we refer to as limited history, could be one word, could be two words, could be three, could be four, but it's a, sp a very limited number. It can't be anything that's just happened before. It can't be the full history. So more generally, uh, using the Markov assumption, we can introduce what we call n-gram models, or just uh, for, for, uh, for, sometimes you will just read n-grams. So basically it's n-gram models. And using the, the Markov assumption, all we can say is uh, that then the last n minus one elements can approximate the effect of the full sequence. So now the joint probability of a given sequence is the multiplication of the conditional probabilities of each element within the sequence given uh, the n minus one elements preceding it. So n is the general number. So if we n if n is two, then we have what we call biograms. So our history is, or our limited history, is just one word. So when n equals 2, then we look at n minus 1 
words preceding a given word, which is only one. So, and this will lead us to a bigram. So our words would be, or our sort of partial sequences would be, I want, want to, to, go, go to, etc. We can do it also with uh, trigrams, and th so n equals three, four grams, etc. And this could go up to nine grams, or but then, uh, as you can imagine, the the higher the value of n, the more likely your data will be sparse in a way that you will not be able to find uh, the probability of a given word, given some history. So uh, everyone is aware of this uh, no notion uh, notation here in, in, in terms of sort of the multiplication, and you know that this yeah. So this basically means the multiplication of uh, double, uh, of the probability of W i given i minus blah 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 uh, for all i's and i here could be i is from one to n. <coughs> so this ingram model could be thought of as uh, a generator of language, really. So you can you can Google it. So you will find many many uh, language models generating. Uh, sometimes gibberish, sometimes uh, meaningful sentences, but people use it to generate sentences. And you can think of it as an automaton that generates sentences. Just, just a way to think about this model is. So, if you give the model the uh, uh, this symbol here, which refers to the sentence initial. So this is where my sentence starts. So it's just a special symbol that uh, defines the start of a sentence. So I give it this. And then it, the model will l return the most likely word given the init uh, sentence initial symbol. And in this case, it will be the. And then the model will move forward and look for all possible words within the model and pick up the one that is most likely given that we have now the. Here we're working with biogram. So we just look at one, uh, one step back into the, uh, in, in the history. And that would be cat, for example. And then, again, we'll do the same and so on and so forth. For each word, we look at the most likely word that is uh, possible, the most likely word to follow. And then we end up with this sentence, the cat eats mice and this is the end of sentence symbol. So basically, for any sentence of, uh, or for any sequence of length m, there will be within the model a most likely sentence, the most likely sentence to occur. And these start and end symbols are used to distinguish between words that are more likely to occur at the beginning of the sentence and at the end of the sentence. So we add them. So once we start pre-processing our data, we add them to the beginning and the end of the sentence so that when we compute the probabilities, we know that this word is more likely to be at the beginning and this word is more likely to be at the end. So our model, basically, consists of probabilities. So that's, that's our model, it's conditional probabilities. And these values are what we refer to as the parameters of the model. So an engram, uh, the, if, you, if you make an engram model, what you're doing basically is recording all uh, conditional probabilities of all possible uh, uh, engrams. So in this case, it's a biogram, so your model will record these values. And, you want, and when you want to compute the probability of a given sentence, what would you, you would do is basically look up these values from your model and then multiply them all together and you get the probability of the sentence. Now the question is, where do we get these values from? So how do we actually compute these values? Uh, what's, the va what's the probability of uh, want given i? Where do I get that from? Uh, of course, the very first thing that you are already familiar with now is that we know that we're going to start from some corpus. We're going to start from the data that is available to us with working with data driven. So let's assume that we, we start with the brown corpus, that which you have used already or parts of it actually. Uh, so what you can do basically in order to estimate the probability of an engram, so the probability of want given i, is uh, in the general case first, so you're interested in uh, the, you want to compute the joint probability of a word wi given a history uh, from wi minus n plus 1 to wi minus 1. So given a history of n minus 1 words. So the way to compute this probability is to count how many times in your corpus 
uh, you have seen the sequence from wi minus uh, n plus 1 to wi and normalize that, divide that by the number of times you have seen just the history, just the n minus 1 words. So examples are always easier to understand. So go, uh, the probability of go given 1, 2. How do I compute this? You go through the, your, your corpus, the brown corpus, you count how many times you actually see 1, 2, go as sequence like this, written as this, in this order, and you divide that by how many times you see want to. So no matter what follows want to. Was it want to go or want to eat, want to, so this is basically how do you, uh, you compute. It's, it's a relevant, uh, the, the, the condition probability. It's, a, it's, it's uh, what we call the uh, relative frequencies of these observed outcomes. So what you want to or the outcome that you're interested on in is one to go, and uh, the the count is then normalized by the number of times this preceding history, the context occurs in general, regardless of what follows. And we refer to this process, it's a simple way of computi computing probabilities as the maximum likelihood estimation. It's just, this is just a name, but uh, the reason it's called maximum Likelihood estimation is probability estimation, right? But the reason it's called maximum is because it maximizes the probability given some text. So what that really means that in your brown corpus, for example, the word Chinese occurs 400 times. And the maximum likelihood estimation of this word is then 400 over 1 million given that the size of the corpus is 1 million. Now this estimation is only good for your corpus. It's not an overall estimation for all for the probability of the word Chinese occurring in English. It's it's the likelihood given what you have as a corpus, and that's why it's maximum. It's it's maximized over the corpus you have. So this is just uh, an aside note. So really, it doesn't. Uh, what matters is that you understand how you compute this and. Uh, it's it's basically counting. So what we're doing here is again is not rocket science in a sense. I mean I everything is well defined, mathematically well defined, the all the formulas. But then in the end, what w the process that we are doing, programming, is counting how many times we see want to go and how many times we see want to, and then we divide that and record it somewhere in our model. So. This is how a biram model again would look like. So you have words, and then you have conditional uh, so, uh, counts, and then you divide the counts of uh, word uh, seeing word one followed by word two over word one. So this is a biram model to get the probabilities. So these are the probabilities. So really, this is the what we refer to as the parameter of the model. So now, if I want to compute the probability of others want to go to the beach. I would start by first others given start symbol, right? So this is the first biogram that I'm going to uh, uh, compute. And what is the value of that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not there, right? So it's, it's zero because it's not part of, so it's not part of our model. So our model will actually give a probability of zero to this sentence. So this is clearly a problem. We can't, we can't have this. It's, uh, uh, basically, this is an outcome or, or, or a, a, a byproduct of any statistical model where you actually build your uh, estimations or, uh, on, on some training corpus. So you are bound to have these cases where the, your data will be sparse. Right, so others didn't occur in our corpus, so we couldn't find a way to account for it, and then we res this this whole computation resulted into zero, which is a very uh, undesirable situation for us. We don't want to actually build a language model that gives a probability of zero to a sentence like "others want to go to the beach," especially that we know that our our corpus has a uh, uh, another sentence which is "I want to go to the beach." So we need to find a way where we actually make a model that give us some good intuition about how likely are some sentences, even though some of the words within these sentences have not occurred in our training corpus. 
So in other words, we want a model to actually give a higher probability to others want to go to the beach in contrast to others the beach go to want to. It doesn't make sense that these two s sentences actually are getting a probability of zero. So one of them is actually more likely, more grammatical. So here we actually introduce what we call smoothing. So uh, smoothing is this process of reassigning some of the probability mass of the frequent events to the infrequent events or the unseen events. So it's called smoothing because you want to make your your model smooth as in you you don't you want to eliminate eliminate all possible hard values. So zero should not be part of our a probability of zero should not be part of our uh, model uh, output. And <coughs> it's also sometimes called discounting because what we do is we move some of the probabilities of from from a very frequent event to unfrequent event. Remember that your probability should sum up to one. So there is there is a constraint so you basically just move some of these probabilities around and there are many ways of doing this the simplest way is the laplace uh, or sometimes called add one uh, smoothing where what you would do is you assume that all events no matter whether you see them or all biograms when no matter whether you, whether you see them or not in your uh, in your training corpus would have at least occurred once so the the event that you have the biogram that you haven't seen in your training corpus is assumed to have uh, one occurrence. So there is no zero occurrences. The the minimum number of occurrences is then one, and this could be achieved mathematically by basically the same equation that we used before to compute the uh, conditional probabilities. We will then add one here the to the frequency count of 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 the biogram. And to the uh, denominator here, we will add the size of the training, uh, or the, uh, sorry, the size of the uh, vocabulary, the number of unique words. And we need to normalize by this because we know that if we add ones here, we're going to add one for v, v, v is the size of the vocabulary, to v uh, biograms, so or v instances. So in order for the probability to still sum up to one, we need to normalize by v. So then this is how our model would have looked like if we if we don't do smoothing so the probability of others uh, given want is zero now when we apply smoothing will the probability will no longer be zero it's still very small so it's not a big number but it's no longer zero it's 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 some value that uh, is basically 1 over 29,534, which is the size of our uh, our vocabulary. So now our model will actually have some intuition. So no longer, so it will be no longer the case where uh, suddenly, if a new unseen word occurs in our uh, sentence, uh, the whole the whole thing will be zero. Uh, yeah. So one practical o issue, also or very common thing to happen, is when you are computing the so again this is a biogram we're computing the probability if I want to go to the beach so we are basically just multiplying conditional probabilities here of biograms and as you know by per definition probabilities are between zero and one right so uh, then you will always have such values and you're always multiplying values that are between zero and one so if you have a very long sentence you're actually likely to run into uh, what we call floating point underflow because the number so a number like this is actually has so many zeros behind the sort of the floating point value so uh, these small probabilities in, in technical pr from a technical point of view will be problematic I mean when you implement this in Lisp you will have a problem with this, the number getting really 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 small so what we do Instead of working in the linear space, we move our computation to the logarithmic space. So, as you might know, the uh, uh, what is multiplication in the uh, in the in the linear space is actually addition in the logarithmic space. So then, instead of multiplying the probability of uh, a and b, what we do is we add the probabilities. And addition, of course, will not make the number as small as 
in the case with uh, <coughs> with with multiplication here. So basically, so the logarithm of a times b is the logarithm of a plus the logarithm of b. And hence, if we have uh, the probability of a times the probability of b, this is actually equivalent to the exponential of log of a plus log of b, right? So uh, what I'm trying to show here is that you can actually go back from the logarithmic space to the linear space if you wanted to. So if you wanted to, you can, after doing this addition, you take the exponential of that and you go back to the linear space. This is a practical issue, really. Not uh, You're not still concerned with this because the assignment is still not out yet. So you're still working on the previous assignment, but keep this in mind. Uh, I, that's, yeah. So we're, we'll manage to review what we have just said. So uh, the likelihood of, uh, so what we, we, we sort of tried to explain uh, in the past 40 minutes or so is that the likelihood of the next word is always dependent on the context. This uh, uh, likelihood of, of uh, a, a chain or a sequence or a sentence of words uh, could be computed using the chain rule, which basically transforms the joint probability into multiplication of uh, conditional probabilities. In an n-gram model, uh, we approximate the history or the context uh, uh, using a limited history. So, using the uh, and this is an application of a Markov assumption, and also actually this is also sometimes referred to as the Markov chain. So, this uh, this way of computing the probability of um, actually, I'm sorry, I didn't also explain that there are different ways of describing a sequence. So here I'm. I'm using now the subscript and superscript from 1 to n. So this means a sequence of words from 1 to n. Before we have written it out, just w1, w2, wn, here is, yeah. Uh, so an n-gram model will take the Markov assumption, which basically is a partial independence assumption, uh, but it also helps us, but it helps us to approximate the, the computations of the probabilities and make sure that we don't run into data sparsity problems. The uh, parameters of the n-gram model, the conditional probabilities, uh, are basically computed using uh, maximum likelihood estimations, which is, again, relative uh, uh, frequencies divided, basically just frequency of the uh, uh <coughs> W1, W2 divided by the frequency of W1, so if we are working with the bigram. Uh, you're very likely to run into this problem of not seeing, uh, not having seen uh, some some uh, bigrams or trigrams. So we use smoothing techniques to avoid this issue of having zero probabilities. Uh, yeah, I think that was it. Next week we'll look at uh, a more uh, sort of we will build on this to understand hidden Markov models in which we try to. Uh, predict a sequence of labels given a uh, an input sequence. So, and more concretely, we'll work with parts of speech tagging, where we have a sequence of words, and we want to predict its uh, parts of speech tags. Yeah, that was all. Uh, if you have any question, um, yeah, I'm around. <laughs> <laughs>